Next up, uh, we have the honorable chair of the Nevada Democratic Party, Judith Whitmer, who will uh, talk to us about how they organized to return the Democratic Party in Nevada back to the people. Um, and I just want to say before she starts that uh, I was really dismayed in the way this was characterized in the media because it's not a takeover. It was not like the communists were taking over the Democratic Party. That was Democrats running against Democrats. And that's what, uh, that's what we do in democracies to choose our leadership. So with that, I'd like to turn the, the, the meeting over to Judith Whitmer to tell us how she pulled off the miracle in Nevada. Thank you. Uh, I was just saying that there's been ongoing controversy over inside versus outside strategy. And I firmly believe in both. I think that it's going to take both and take us all working together to make real change in the system and in a, in a structure that we know is corrupt and doesn't work for the people. Um, and as Larry said, it was a, it was a fair election. Um, we know that the media and the establishment is acting like it wasn't. Um, but this was the ongoing effort of, of the past few years since the 2016 election, in which we all know, you know, we felt like the, the election was rigged. There was a lot of, um, of oppression and obstruction of progressives. And that's when we decided that we needed to do something about it here in the state of Nevada. Um, we saw a lot of missed opportunities coming out of 2016, uh, but we were fully determined uh, to make real uh, progress here in Nevada by organizing. And as we all know, progressives are really great at grassroots organizing. That's our strength. And that's one of the things that the establishment doesn't really understand is that not only do we have the will and the passion and the drive to succeed, but we also have the people on our side. Um, the things that we're fighting for is what people believe in. And so we have the majority. We just have to learn to organize more and work together more and make sure that we're fighting together because when we fight together, we win together. That's what not me, us means. And we are going to continue that philosophy of not me, us as we work for around the country to bring real change. Um, for those of you that haven't heard um, how we achieve this, I'll just give a brief synopsis and then, you know, you're welcome to answer questions if there's time. But after 2016, in which I was a, a delegate at the state convention for Bernie, um, and we saw a lot of um, obstruction here in Nevada at that state convention, I'm sure you guys have heard about throwing chairs and other things, but the reality was I was at that convention, no chairs were thrown, there was no violence. But, was, but, but when I began to realize what was, what was really wrong with the system when the um, state party chair at the time uh, decided that she was just going to leave the stage, nothing, you know, we weren't told anything. We all quietly waited for her to return. And a significant amount of time later, probably at least 30 minutes later, she returned to the stage after a line of state troopers formed a, a semicircle around the stage, um, <laughs> just like in a show of force. And we were all standing there just quietly waiting. There was absolutely no violence at all. And I think that was the beginning for me of realizing that I needed to get involved inside party politics instead of just the activism I was doing on the outside. Um, so in 2017, I was elected to the Clark County Executive Board, which is Las Vegas and surrounding areas. So that's the largest population center here in Nevada. Um, and then started to work within the party to start bringing change, to start doing things differently. Um, I served two terms on the Clark County Executive Board. And in 2020, when um, with the most recent election, uh, well, starting in 2019, I should back up just a minute. In 2019, we decided that we needed to, to have a stronger show of force within the party. So we chartered our own caucus um, called Left Caucus. And Left Caucus became a chartered democratic organization working within the party. And it says on our mission statement very clearly, and in our bylaws that had to be approved by the establishment, that we are working to move the party to the left and that we are advocating on progressive policy and issues. So we made it very clear what our mission was <laughs> from the very start. 
I think they just didn't think that we could achieve our goals. Uh, but we, what we did from there is we organized heavily around Bernie's campaign here in Nevada. As you know, Bernie won Nevada by a landslide. It was a landslide victory here. And uh, we celebrated with Senator Nina Turner that night. Um, but that was a real thrill for us to get to that point where it was an overwhelming majority of people that came out and caucused for Bernie. Um, for some of you that aren't familiar with caucuses, um, it's a very antiquated system. Um, but we were able to get our government to add early voting, early caucus sites and early caucus voting. And that was really telling for us because that's where we saw people standing in line for hours to cast their vote for Bernie. And we actually had ranked choice voting here in Nevada. You probably haven't heard a lot about that. Um, that, you know, that isn't mentioned very often, but during that caucus, during the early voting in the caucus, because of the way it was structured, we had to employ ranked choice voting. It's just that establishment refused to call it that, but that's technically what it was. Um, so, you know, Bernie was the majority for first choice and second choice on that ranked choice voting. So that's how we won here by grassroots organizing and left caucus worked hand in hand with the Las Vegas DSA chapter here as well. Um, and they were both instrumental in Bernie's win. Uh, so from there, we organized around all those caucus goers. Um, I had the list of every single caucus goer that voted for Bernie, every single person that signed up for the convention as delegates, um, because at that point at the caucus, you're elected in your caucus or in your precinct as a delegate to the county convention. And from there, we organized around the platform. We passed the most progressive platform in Clark County history. And then from there, we kept everybody engaged and active by organizing around the state party platform. And we put up the slate at the state convention for state party officers, at-large officers. Um, by, by the time we got to state convention, um, it was apparent that Bernie delegates had registered and were going to the state convention in large numbers. Um, we had a progressive slate. We ran 10 candidates and won nine out of 10 of those candidates. And that began our majority to build our majority on the state executive board. Um, from there, we kept getting members onto the state central committee, kept building our majority on the state central committee so that by March, we were able to elect our entire progressive slate of officers of executive board officers um, with myself as state party chair, but everybody else running with me were also progressives and we won the entire slate. So by doing that now effectively as the state party chair, um, we can level the playing field. So there's no more tipping the scales in favor of establishment candidates. There's no more um, giving resources and tools only to establishment preferred candidates. Um, who essentially were able to keep locking progressives out at the primary level. Now, progressives could run during a primary, but they were essentially blocked from getting any further than that. So now we're building our own machine, our own transparent and accountable machine to elect progressive candidates. Um, and that's why this is so important because we need more people in Congress like, like the squad, like AOC, um, Rashida and Jay Powell and Ilhan Omar, we need more of those. And we need to send Nina Turner there and Cori Bush, our newest member of the squad. Look at, what a, look at what an impact she's having already as a freshman. So we need to send Senator Nina Turner to Congress. We need to keep electing progressives to Congress. But what we also need to do is not forget what kind of change we can affect in our own communities because we have real power. We have power, progressives have power. We have to learn to use it, to wield it, to build it together, to fight together, because that's how we get to a point where we start sending progressive candidates to our state legislatures and to, to Congress as well. But we need to elect progressives to school board, to local city councils. We need to start making those inroads at every single level and electing progressive candidates who are working to represent the needs of people instead of special interests and corporate interests. We need elected officials that answer to us, not to their donors. And we are only going to get that if we 
work for that change together and that we believe in that change. And I believe in that change. And I believe that all of us working together can really, really have an impact in our communities and then on the national stage as well. But remember, you can, there's so many things we can do at the community level um, that you can't always just be focused on the national stage. What can you do in your own community to bring change? What can you do to remove obstruction and clear a path for progressives to start winning these elections? That's what this is all about. Um, it's to get us to a place where we are building and we are, are empowering progressive candidates and we are recruiting those candidates and electing those candidates because we believe that by working together, we can affect real change, real progress, and we deserve a world of justice and equality. And we're going to get there by working together. So thank you all for being here. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take questions. But that's just sort of a brief summary of how we did it here in Nevada. Thank you. Uh, Judith, could you talk about perhaps how you, what your, 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 board look like like did you have a data wizard did you have someone tracking positions how did you how did you manage the data because really this is a ultimately a data challenge to to track candidates and get them elected yeah so are you talking about for the executive board or for um, uh, all of the organizing that you did okay so yes data is extremely valuable i feel very strongly that it isn't just about collecting that data it's knowing how to utilize that data so you've got to be able to analyze it and figure out ways to utilize it. And I think that's going to be the key to winning elections in the future. So for us, we tracked every single member of the state central committee. We tracked the number of touches. We did um, some experiments with texting and with, uh, with mass texting. We did some experiments with, um, with recording little um, speeches or little intros for ourselves and then um, there's the technology then that that goes directly to their voicemail as a phone call from your number and you're hoping to get return calls and that was extremely successful technology because um, I know myself I got in just one day like 50 phone calls which is pretty big that's a big deal to get 50 phone calls return phone calls because they they thought that it was actually me calling leaving a message which it was but not, I didn't have to do it 50 times. In other words, I don't have to do it once and it went out to 50 people. And then I got all those phone calls returning my call. So, you know, those are very valuable ways of using data. So we know then who, who's responding, um, what's successful. You have to track, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, and again, it's going to take all of these technologies and a willingness to be creative um, to give ourselves an edge. Um, I think that's going to be critical because it's not going to be just about uh, knocking on doors and phone banking anymore. You've got to be able to reach people numerous times wherever they are. You're not going to be able to expect them to come to us either. We have to be able to have expanded outreach, expand, and, you know, expand the number of touches we do with each and every voter. And we have to be able to um, find ways to really reach them wherever they are. And we, we do a lot of community engagement here as well. We do service projects. Um, we're firm believers in doing mutual aid and service projects here in the Vegas area. Um, so we reach a lot of people that way as well because it's just that, that continuous engagement where people, you're not just preaching at them or you're not just asking them for a vote. You're actually there helping in the community. And people see that and they respond to that very, very well. And then they want to know how to get involved. Um, we do a lot of, of outreach in, in um, the west side of Vegas, which is um, a, a, has an extreme number of homelessness. Um, and we do regular events there to provide supplies and stuff for the homeless in that area. Um, we're doing. We're trying to do more and more engagement in the Latino community and the Black community and the. Asian community to make sure that we are being represented of everyone and that every voice is heard and that they, that they know we are, we are there to actually support and represent the needs of everyone. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to participate, has the opportunity to have their voices heard. Because in many, many cases, 
They feel like the Democratic Party has neglected the needs of those communities and that, you know, the party has had a tendency to just pay lip service at election time and ramp it up during election time. But then they don't ever see, see them the rest of the year. Well, we're making sure that they see us, that they know we are part of the community and that we care about the community. Um, so as we build that sense of community together, that also gives us power and gives us more and more people that engage with us. So that's, and you, but you've gotta be able to track all that data. You have to have somebody that's really great at the data. Um, we have an actual data director. And so, um, and she works for the Bernie campaign. And so she tracks all the data, she analyzes all the data, and then we meet and decide how, how can we use best to use that data. But you have to have the data, you have to track that data. Um, for those who joined late, uh, this is being recorded. And so the, 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 uh, the videos of, of these workshops will be posted later. Um, and I will go through the agenda of the two days also so everyone knows uh, what, what's going on more specifically. Um, but we do have about 20 minutes left for questions. If you have any questions for uh, Judith, um, please raise your hand and I will call on each of you. And I believe everyone can, can unmute themselves. Um, so, uh, uh, Tom uh, Havilka, go ahead. Uh, Judith, I wanted to ask you a question. It's, it's great that you have, that you progressives have now are taking control of the party. And I assume you're expanding to, to include all the Democrats, even some of those uh, <laughs> who have more moderating voices. But say what you want about the Harry Reid machine. They did a pretty good job of winning elections. They have both, uh, both Senate seats, far and above the majority of uh, House seats, and also they've won a lot of local elections, and the governor is a Democrat. So my question is, how do you, are, have you found that you you can still keep that success going? Have you noticed uh, the general public, has there been any great defections from your party uh, because of its shift to the left? Because there's one of the ongoing myths is that if you get too far left, the the normal people will leave type of thing. And I don't think that's necessarily the case, but have you noticed any great shift have defected no, from your party? I, no, I haven't, Tom. Um, Nevada was already experiencing higher numbers of nonpartisan registration. I will sit very proudly say that Nevada is very good at, at voting and, and having holding free and fair and accessible elections here in Nevada. We make it really easy for people to vote. We just passed legislation for, for uh, mail-in ballots for everyone. Um, we do a lot, a ton of early voting, a lot of voting locations. Um, we make it very, very easy for people to vote. So Democrats have done a really good job of that here. Um, the Reed machine, you're right, was extremely effective. Um, but I will say also, that the way that that business has been done in the past was all about maintaining power and maintaining the status quo, which again, you might say, okay, they were successful at electing certain people to office, but they were also successful in obstructing progressives and uh, obstructing progressive change, obstructing progressive policies and ish, and you know progressive and progressive legislation that was going through the state legislature. So um, I'm very much aware of the success, but from my viewpoint, it's time to build on that success as a foundation and start moving into a direction of, of, of openness, transparency, um, working with and for the people instead of um, working at the top to obstruct everyone else. Um, so we are simply building on that, on the success of the past. Um, we are not seeing any mass defections in general from the general population. Um, like I said, we've seen that nonpartisan numbers are going up everywhere. And everything that I hear in being in the community tells me that the reason for that is because, not because they think somebody's too left or too far right. It's because they simply don't want to buy into party loyalty. They want to vote for the candidate of their choice. And because they don't feel that parties are doing that anymore. They're not representing people or letting people have their voices heard. They're more about holding power. 
Um, you know, there's this, this whole gridlock because of the need for power on both sides. And that's not what people really want to buy into. Um, we also see that when you, and we have automatic voter registration here. So if you don't select a party, then you're going into the nonpartisan category. And a lot of times younger people haven't decided where they align or how they align. And a lot of them align with uh, democratic socialism. Well, where does that fall under the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? And um, we're trying to change that. So if you believe in democratic socialism, there's a place for you in the Democratic Party until such time as we get to a point where we can actually have an effective and viable third party, but we're not there yet. So our best bet is to build strength and power within the Democratic Party, um, keep making efforts to remove all that obstruction and give more opportunities to progressives and leftists to advance, um, then we're in a better place that if that's our ultimate goal, goal is to get to open primaries, ranked choice voting, third party, you've got to clear the path first because otherwise you're going to knock your head against that obstruction constantly because both parties, you know, have basically um, an agreement to hold that power. They don't want to see a third party rise, uh, which would be the ideal solution, but it's not going to happen anytime soon until we do the work to get us there. So that's the way I see that, but there's been no mass general defection. What we saw is what you heard in the media. Um, certain people quit their positions with the party to go to work for a PAC that's now running a coordinated campaign in competition with the state party. It's called the Victory Fund. Um, they put out mailings. They use our voter file to solicit donations and stuff. But it's all going to the top of the ticket. They're neglecting down ballot races. They only care about the top of the ticket. That's traditional for coordinated campaigns. That's another thing that we're changing here. Because as much as the top of the ticket matters, as far as the governor and the senator, it also matters greatly to the lives of Nevadans to have down ballot candidates that represent them in school boards and city councils, county commission, and the state legislature. Those are the people making decisions that affect our daily lives. So as much as it is critical to elect the top of the ticket, it's even more critical to elect the bottom of the ticket. So that's what we're focusing on and working on with people. And, and again, the majority of people are with us. There's always a few that are used to having all the power, all the control that have decided that they don't want to work with us. It's not us keeping them from working with us because we've had an open door policy all along. So anybody that wants to work with us, we're here but they don't, they've made it very clear that they're not willing to work with us unless we hand over control back to them. We're not going to do that. We were elected fairly, um, but that's the way they see it. Uh, so I'm not gonna waste time and get distracted from what we're working on to try to get those handful of people um, back to working with us. It's not necessary and it's not going to, um, be it to our best advantage to do that either, because then we're back to the whole same status quo. And that's exactly what we're trying to get away from. And when they made this big deal about, you know, transferring the 450 out of our account prior, just prior to the election, um, we know that their polling was telling them that I was going to win and their candidate was going to lose. So they quickly transferred $450,000 out of our account, out of our federal account. And when they talk about all this massive, staff quitting. There were actually only two people on staff at that time because after the general election, basically everybody went away. They, you know, that's just the way elections go. So they only had two people still on staff at the time. Um, and the one person was the executive director at the time. She'd already taken a job with the DNC, which means effectively only one person decided not to stay on, not at our request. She just quit. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of things that we've since discovered that we're starting to realize why the establishment wanted to hang on to power and control so badly. Um, I can't discuss everything right now, but I will tell you that as we peel those layers back, it becomes even more and more obvious how critical it is for progressives to start taking an active role in the Democratic Party um, within each state, uh, because otherwise, um, that corruption, that status quo, that good old boys network will continue in every single state. 
at every level of government. And it's up to us to, to make that change. Thank you, Judy. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, we have uh, a couple more minutes where we can uh, ask questions of Judith. The next up is Donald Smith. So go ahead, Donald. <clears throat> okay, hi. Um, my question is about the um, messaging of whether you call yourself progressives or socialists or democratic socialists. And um, because, um, you know, like Denmark, Sweden, they're not socialist countries, they're social democracies. And Paul Krugman, um, Cornell West, uh, and Noam Chomsky say that Bernie Sanders isn't even a socialist of any kind. He's a social democrat or FDR or liberal. So my question is, what I heard in the news was that the socialists took over the Nevada party. Is that, um, maybe people are trying to change the word of socialist and use it as a synonym for, for progressive. But I want you to talk about, you know, whether, whether people consider themselves socialists or, dem or progressives or are they the same thing? Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, basically they're the same thing, but I really don't label myself. I believe in democratic socialism and the principles of democratic socialism, but it's, for me, it's all about policy and issues and about, um, the fact that our government doesn't represent us. You know, we pay all those taxes, the rich don't pay their fair share of taxes, um, and we're not getting any return on our investments. It's time to start investing in ourselves. Um, so I think a lot of this has to do with how people feel about the role of government um, and whether they think government should be providing certain services or if you think all of those services should come from the private sector, which to me is like, okay, yeah, why are you gonna turn over control to the private sector of every single thing? Look what happens when they control utilities. They, they, they just don't repair, they don't keep things maintained. I mean, there's more accountability with the government than there is with private industry, in my, in my opinion. Um, from my perspective, I've had a lot of people try to corner me or label me about socialism. Um, but again, it comes from a place of fear. People just don't understand what that means. You know, even the Democratic Party leaders within the Democratic Party will condemn socialism. Um, you know, I had that happen here too, where they're saying, oh, you can't use the word socialist. You can't use the word democratic socialist. Make sure you don't use any of that terminology and anything you say related to the Democratic Party, you know. Um, well, that's kind of bullshit because if we have to have to do what we think aligns with our own values and principles and not be afraid of that. Um, we know that the media, both parties, have demonized democratic socialism. Um, they try to do that with Bernie consistently. And you're right, he's not really, not really the true definition of a socialist or leftist. Um, and he believes in a lot of values that would be considered social democracy. Uh, again, I don't think it's about the terminology. I think people have to decide that for themselves. I think it's about staying true to our values and principles and being clear on that and being willing to be bold and take bold action on, on those issues uh, rather than get stuck on what term we use or what label we use. Most of the time I use the word progressives because um, I think it's easier for people to relate to uh, and I don't get as much pushback on that as, as, a, as if I were just up here saying, oh, I'm a socialist. Well. Technically, I probably wouldn't even be myself considered a socialist, um, but a democratic socialist or social democrat, definitely. Again, I think it has to do with um, people being uh, misinformed about what that even means for so long, because we know that the Democratic Party doesn't want to embrace that because they're more afraid of losing their corporate donors than a than embracing an ideology that would actually help people. So we have a lot of work to do in that area as far as talking to people, helping them understand what that really means um, and not being afraid of that terminology or saying that, hey, yes, I'm a democratic socialist. I believe in these principles and values. Um, but I also don't think it's necessary to constantly, uh, you know, hit that, hit that term or hit that word over people's head or anything else because I just don't think that that's how people think when you're engaging with them. If you engage, and that's, and, and you know, Bernie was very upfront about saying, I'm a democratic socialist, 
But when he was speaking to the people and his speeches and engaging with people and had these massive rallies, you didn't actually hear, hear him standing up there talking about democratic socialism per se. What he was doing was talking about his values and principles and how important he thought those values and principles were to bring real change to the American people. Um, so that's what I try to do as well, is talk about what I believe in and not so much talk about, um, get into the weeds on what democratic socialism actually is, because no matter what we say, we're going to be attacked by the media. We're going to be attacked by both parties. We're going to be called socialists no matter what. So does it really matter? If we can connect with people and they know we're working for them, they're not going to care about what the media calls it. So that's, that's, that's my perspective on it. Thank you. Uh, Raymond, I saw your hand go up uh, a couple of times. Did you have a question, Raymond? Um, well, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to say thank you, Judith, for being here at the Summit for Democracy and for your wonderful work. It inspires us. And I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew how to uh, to raise their hand um, in the participants window if you have a question uh, so you can be called on or type your question in the chat. And um, I uh, see that uh, Don Smith got his question out. He was uh, looking for a way to raise your hand. Um, you could also use the reactions button. Um, and uh, Judith, thanks again. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Thanks, Raymond. And just um, just before you uh, any more questions, I did want to say that um, Larry and Raymond and others at PDPR, we worked together on that. Um, if some of you were delegates to the national convention like we were, I was a PLEO for Bernie delegate, and I was the, the delegation chair for Nevada as well to the DNC. Uh, we worked really hard. We're the ones that put together that pledge um, to vote no on the platform if it didn't include Met Medicare for all. Um, so we've stayed very much in touch with that network of Bernie delegates. Um, I've worked with Our Revolution. I've worked with Progressive Democrats of America. Um, I work closely with PDPR. Um, that's when I'm talking about the inside outside strategy, um, whether they're registered Democrats or not. There are lots of people working that are willing to work with us to bring change. Um, I encourage people to stay in the Democratic Party because sheer numbers will get us there in some cases. Like the State Central Committee, you have to be a member of the uh, Democrat. You have to be registered as a Democrat to be on the State Central Committee. And then once you have a majority on the State Central Committee, you can start really um, winning these offices, the executive board, and it's the state central committee that is the governing body for the Democratic Party. So the more, you can, the more control, the more majority you have to affect change at that level, um, that's where you start to see that it has a real effect um, and, and it starts to be a domino effect. So, you know, I encourage people to do that, but some people aren't comfortable with that. And that's okay too. That's why I said it's gotta be an inside outside strategy. We've all got to work together. Um, and I know there's another session coming up about the structure of the Democratic Party. There's going to be a lot here about bylaws and how important they are. And please, please, if you get the chance to go to those sessions, do so because that information is critical and going to be critical to your success if you decide to adopt these strategies going forward. Um, you have to know your state party structure. You have to know your bylaws um, because the establishment has been very, very good about weaponizing those bylaws against us to obstruct us. So the more you know how to fight back, the more effective you're going to be. So I just wanted to put that out there and encourage you to attend those sessions and get familiar with the bylaws and parliamentary procedure as well because as much as some of us think it's really, really boring stuff, <laughs> sorry, Larry, but it, it's absolutely critical to our success. And when Judith says us, she means us the people um, uh, <laughs> when she's saying that. Um, so we have a few more minutes for questions. The next up is uh, Christine. So Christine, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um I, um, I'm from Michigan and I've been on the state central committee, but when we're in the meetings, a lot of times, like, how did you get a voice in the meeting? Because a lot of times they'll call the question 
if we're asking too many questions or have the opposite opinion, they cut us off during these Zoom meetings. So I want Zoom meetings because I live far from the state capitol or wherever they used to have the meetings. And I want to keep that. But how did you get a voice? Like, how did you get over that? That's all. Well, the way we got over that is by building a majority. So um, once you have a majority, then if there's a motion to amend the bylaws or a motion of resolution or something else on the floor, um, they're not going to have the votes to obstruct you because if somebody calls the question and you've already organized ahead of time and you know that that's not what you want to happen, then you can effectively have the votes to uh, negate that. Um, so that's why it's critical to know the bylaws and to know parliamentary procedure as well, because for everything they throw at you, there is a solution. That's the nice thing about parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules. There is a way to fight back against every single thing that they can throw at you. Um, and, and that's been a learning experience for me as well over the past couple of years, um, because, um, you know, I was so used to things happening a certain way or, or meetings being conducted a certain way and being totally, totally frustrated by it. But once I started to learn how we could fight back, um, and again, it takes organization too. So as, as the progressives, as the caucus, as the left caucus, we organize ahead of each state central committee. We know what's going to be on the agenda. We know what we want to achieve. And we work together to come to consensus ahead of that to decide what we want the outcome to be. And then we vote together as a block. And you brought up a good point. Uh, that is probably the most frequently abused uh, incidental motion in the toolkit, uh, which is to call the question. And then the chair usually misapplies it and takes away your right to speak. And those are the kinds of things that we will be talking about in the workshops that will be happening later today, both in uh, Tom Helveka's and uh, in Raymond's uh, workshop specifically. And then if you have questions about your rights, uh, Jeff Weston can answer those as well. Um, is, I don't see any other raised hands. If there's no more raised hands. Actually, Raymond, was there any, any questions in the chat that we wanted to bring up? I didn't see any specific questions in the chat yet. Um, hopefully I've tracked everything. Um, but uh, again, folks can raise their hand in the participants window. Um, and uh, I do want to again thank everyone for being here. I've been dropping some links in the chat uh, so that you know how to join us in these efforts to uh, uh, develop your skills, know your rights, and uh, how to build tactics with PDPR. Um, and uh, we'll have some donation links to drop into to help support this work. And um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, maybe you can come off mute and uh, we'd love to hear from you. And Thank I did you. have one final thing to say too, is that one of the things that um, I've gotten the most pushback for is um, being willing to be an advocate on issues, um, which, we, which I clearly stated in my campaign for state party chair is that we're gonna move the state party to a role of advocacy on policy and issues and for the needs of our communities. And I've done that and I've gotten extreme pushback, like shut up and just raise money, um, all kinds of slurs, all kinds of, you know, pushback. But when I look at it, it's still a very, very small fraction um, from the comments that I get, because most of the comments I get are very positive, even if they don't always agree exactly, they're still very positive. Um, so you can't get distracted by the negativity or the attacks or anything else that you might, might face. But for the first time ever, the state party here in Nevada is taking on a role of advocacy. And you have more power um, by using your voice than you realize. The party could be doing much, much more to affect change within each community um, just by taking on a role of advocacy. Um, and then you know, we're holding our elected officials accountable, accountable for the first time ever here in Nevada. Um, so that's a big, big step forward. It's not everything we hope to achieve, but at least we're on the path to, to real progress and real change. And that's why I think this kind of work is very, very critical in every state. And thanks to everyone for being here.